invite you to go with me to the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. The title of today's message is The First Gospel. And may I add to that the first gospel and the only gospel. Amen. And we are going to, beginning in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, show you that. God was never surprised by anything that happened in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis. And so I want to invite you to join me for the next several weeks as we begin here, go through the rest of the Bible, showing you God's plan from the very beginning and how that came to be and how all of that laid out throughout the entire Bible until we get to the Gospel of Luke where the Bible tells us that the Son of God was born. So we're going to take a trip through the Bible, stopping along the way, showing you and me God's plan for humanity. And it begins not in Genesis chapter 3, but it begins in eternity past in the mind of God. So I want to I want to invite you to join us. I want you to begin to look at your Bible because we're going to stop along the way in several passages throughout Scripture. Would you stand with me and let us read these two verses? Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. Beginning in verse 14, the Bible says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel would you pray with me father thank you for this passage of scripture thank you lord for your word now father i pray that beginning in this text and as we journey throughout scripture I pray that you help us to present the first gospel, the only gospel. I pray, Father, that you would open our eyes to see that nothing that has occurred ever caught you by surprise. Nothing that the enemy has done or any of us have ever done surprised you, informed you, did anything except that in your sovereign will and plan, you are demonstrating to us your love and how much you love us and how much you love your creation. I pray, Lord, that throughout the next several weeks you will help us to see that. Genesis to Revelation. We pray that in Jesus' name. You may be seated. There is a story, and some historians tell us uh, that prior to the to, to the nation or our nation, America, entering World War II, there were some conversations that were going on behind the scenes that very few people knew about, even the vice president was kept at bay on some of the information. President Roosevelt and the Prime Minister of England were having conversations about the war and about what was going on. And these conversations were perhaps the Prime Minister's presentation to the President of the 
United States as to why they should step in and they should be involved. And eventually, uh, the United States of America became involved in that war. And though, we had, and though we paid a heavy price, we ultimately, along with our allies, were the victors in that war. There's something else that was going on that the Vice President at the time did not know about. And to his surprise, not having had any experience as a president, and upon the death of President Roosevelt, he discovered that the United States of America had been working on a bomb. A bomb that he, the Vice President, would later have to use to end World War II. Those conversations were going on without him knowing and without a whole lot of people. Sometimes those conversations have to occur. There's a conversation that is going on in chapter 3 that we rarely look at. We read it, but we read it rather quickly. There is some discussion going on here. Actually, there's only one person speaking, and the other three are listening. Or should we say four? And there's something occurring in chapter 3. But before I talk about that, let me just quickly tell you about chapter 1 and chapter 2. Chapter 1 in the book of Genesis is the book that tells us how God created everything. When God created everything. It says so in the first words of the Bible. It says, in the beginning. God created it. God created everything. The Bible tells us that in, in chapter 1 that he created everything in six days. I happen to be one of those preachers that believes it was in six literal days. I also happen to believe, with along, along with a lot of other preachers and theologians, that there was nothing between verse 1 and verse 2 of chapter 1. No such thing as some type of chaotic thing that happened before, and then God had to recreate whatever happened after that chaos of verse 1. In other words, what I'm telling you is that I don't believe in any gap theory or any, any theory, theory of any kind that tells us that there is something between those two verses. God created everything in six literal days. And chapter 1 tells us that. It tells us how he did it. And then when you get to chapter 2, the first three verses are kind of a summary of what God did. And, and then chapter 2 begins to outline what I think is what happened specifically in verse or in, in the sixth day when God created Adam. Where he put him. He put him in the garden. He put him all that he did. In, in chapter 2 we, we are told exactly what God did with man once he created him. He created Eve. And then he assigned him. He put him in the garden of Eden and assigned him the task of naming all the animals. And no helper was found for Adam. And, and so God put him to sleep and he created from his own body and uh, one of his ribs, he created Eve and he brought her to him and he was uh, impressed and he gave her a name and, and, and they formed the first relationship uh, that you and I today call marriage and that is marriage is the relationship between one man and one woman. Amen. And that's the end of that. Amen. Uh, and God created that, God did that. Uh, and so that's what you get in chapter 2. So things are going along nicely in chapter 2. And then when we get to chapter 3, the Bible tells us that there is a particular animal who above everything else was more cunning than, than all of the other animals. And the Bible tells us that that was the serpent. And so we are told in, in verse at the beginning of chapter uh, 3, we are told... Uh, what happened? Uh, who are the, the people involved there? Who are who, are, who is involved? There's a serpent. There's Satan. There's uh, the woman, and and 
then and then there's Adam, and we have what we call the temptation of man. Uh, in some of your Bibles, you may have that heading, uh, and you have the temptation of man, and man is tempted to do exactly what God told him not to do under false pretenses and guile, and so then. Uh, we know that they fell for the lie and they both ate and they discovered something that they didn't know about themselves and then they discovered that something was terribly wrong after they had eaten of the fruit that they had been forbidden not to eat. And <clears throat> then you have in the next few verses, God comes along and, and is looking for them and, and they hide from him and they're, they're ashamed of, of what happened. And God begins to speak to them. And he says to them, who told you that you were naked? And that conversation is going on. And, and, and then through the conversation, we discover that uh, the finger pointing begins to happen. And so Adam pointed to Eve. Eve pointed to the serpent. And uh, the serpent was caught red-handed. And, and now we've got a problem. And then, beginning in verse 8, we begin to see the judgment, what we know as the judgment, or God dealing with what has just happened. But I want to tell you this morning that even though that occurs, that is, was not a surprise to God. God wasn't surprised by that. He wasn't embarrassed by that. Uh, he didn't shake his head and ask himself, what am I going to do with my children and my creation? He was, he was not surprised by any of that. And while we may all not be able to completely explain all of those things, we know from reading all of the scripture that God wasn't surprised by that. And so, beginning in those verses, that is discovered. And, uh, and so then, God deals with the first uh, element involved in the in the fall and he addresses his conversation to the serpent and he looks at the serpent and then he says to the serpent because you have done this because you have done this you have participated you are the one that uh, orchestrated this whole event this whole lie you orchestrated it now he is going to pronounce to the serpent what is going to happen. So I want to give you three things that happen in here, and which is going to launch us off into some very important things. So you need to pay attention to what is happening in verse 14, but specifically in verse 15. All right. So we're going to try to help you uh, see that, and, and then we're going to spring off of this and go on to other places to talk about uh, the first gospel and why this is important for us. To understand. It's important that we understand from the very beginning of Scripture that God's plan plays out all the way through. And that, again, let me remind you, He wasn't surprised by anything. God was never caught by surprise in anything that happens. I want you to know that if God was caught by surprise with any of this that happened, then He's not God. He wouldn't know it all if He was surprised. Think about that for a second. If you if you can surprise God, because if you can you can surprise me, well I didn't know that about you. <laughs> well no one ever told me that about this church. Whatever you can surprise me, because I don't know it all, and I try to act like I don't know it all. No, I just don't know it. All, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know it. All. I don't know it all. So, but God knows everything. That's one of his characteristics. That's who he is. He knows it all. Now, if you choose to go down the other path, that somehow God must have been surprised, or some, somehow, somehow God had this plan going on, he had this creation going on, but somehow, some way, it, 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 it got out of hand and it got out of his control and things happened and God had to step in and fix it. If you go down that path, you're going to chase a whole lot of other things. 
and they're going to lead you astray. And I'm here to tell you one more time, God was never caught by surprise. If that's the case, then there is a plan playing out. And there is a process in that plan that is happening. And I can't explain it all to you, and neither of us, even the most wisest of theologians, probably cannot do the same, though we can come close to some things we know that God was never caught by surprise. And so the first thing that I want to point out to you this morning, and, and you've got your notes there, and I hope that's helping out for some of you. Some of you uh, like to, to do that, and so we put it in there for you. So the first thing that I want to point out to you is I want to talk to you about the curse. Because in verse 14, the Bible tells us that God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed. But I want you to notice what happens in this text. In verse 14, we are told of the curse of the serpent. And we're going to explain all of that. But he says, you are cursed. But I want you to notice, the first thing I want you to notice about the curse is that the serpent was highlighted. The serpent was highlighted. Highlighted above everything else. You know, when you take a, a yellow marker, an orange marker, and you highlight something in a book, that means you are distinguishing that particular statement or that particular sentence from the rest of the paragraph. It, it means something to you. You're, you're separating it from the rest for a reason. And God says in verse 14, you are cursed more than, in my Bible, my translation of the Bible, it says all cattle. In some of your translations, it may say livestock. Or and then in the second one, it says, and more than every beast of the field. That's two distinct species or uh, two distinct kinds of animals. The first one is cattle or livestock. And it's probably a reference to uh, what we know now as more docile, domesticated kind of animals. You know, cows and, and, and those types of things. Those kinds of animals, a little more domesticated softer kind of beast or animal. But then he mentions in, in the second half of that verse, and more than every beast, in some of your translations, it may say wild beast or something along those lines. That is a reference to the more uh, wilder animal, the more out there in the jungle, in the forest kind of animal out there and, and that sort of thing. So they're too, too distinct. But he says to the serpent, in comparison to the livestock or cattle, whichever you want to use, and the beast or the wild beast, when, when you compare those two different sets of animals, you are going to be cursed more than them or more than they. You're going to be, your problem, your struggle, your challenge, your difficulty, what's going to happen to you is going to be a whole lot more than, them, than the rest of them. But I want you to notice something else. I want you to notice that because of the fall, because of what happened in the previous verses, that conversation between the serpent, whom we will talk about later as, as you know, also referring to Satan, but that conversation and that eating of that fruit and all of that that happened in those verses, is a cons uh, the results of that are in these verses that we're looking at. And I want you to notice that while the serpent was held or highlighted and held to a, to a, to a even deeper or, or, or di more difficult standard, everyone suffered because of the fall. Even that cow and even the wild beast, all of God's creation suffered because of what mankind did. Man himself has no one to blame for what is going on and what has happened to the planet and to creation except man himself. But God was a God, God is a God of justice. And he is, he is executing justice here because that's who he is. Don't let the world tell you that all God is is a God of love. He's that and, and, and he's, no one can compare to the love of God. But you and I need to understand that that loving God, that gracious God, that merciful God, that beautiful God, that good, good Father is also a just God and a righteous God. And there is a nature of him that he has to execute. He must execute righteousness and, and judgment. He, that, that just, just like it is in his nature to pour out his love, it is in his nature to pour out righteousness and justice. Equally the same. And he does that. 
in this in this passage, and, and he does it in verse 315. And, and that's what we need to understand. And so he says to the serpent, <clears throat> I am going to highlight you above everybody else. And so the serpent was highlighted. But then again, notice that the serpent was hampered or hindered. Notice what he says. You are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go. On your belly you shall go. So then, of course, the question comes, was the serpent a walking beast or an animal? Or was it a walking lizard? Or was it a flying one? Did it have wings? Did it have legs? What, what did this animal look like prior to this event? Because the implication, notice that he is comparing them. He's, he's saying, here's a cattle. Cattle we know of, unless you know different. I know of cattle, they walk on all fours, right? They have legs. I've never seen a cow fly, but maybe in cartoons. <laughs> and only for a little while. But, but they walk. They walk on four legs. All right? Uh, and then we have animals that can stand on their hind legs and walk for a while. Uh, and then we have, we have birds. And, and, and then we have uh, lizards that have legs, but then we have lizards that can stand up and run on their hind legs and run very fast for a little while in those legs and are pretty fast. And then of course we have things like uh, flying dragons and that sort of thing and, and I'm not telling you they exist, I'm just telling you that you know when you look at it, they, we paint dragons with wings. Maybe, maybe the staff, who knows? The truth of the matter is that nobody knows, but whatever the serpent could do, if anything, whether it was it could walk, or it had wings and it could fly, and, and who knows, God altered the serpent's physiology, its body. He, he did something to it. Maybe he took his legs away. Maybe he took the wings away. The curse brought upon the serpent a highlight. He was separated from the rest and he was hampered. He was hindered by God that whatever it is that he could do before, he could now not do. You can debate whether he had legs or whether he had wings or a combination of, whatever you want to think, there's not enough in scripture to tell you. And I don't know of a theologian who has come up with the right answer. It really doesn't matter because whatever that was, God hindered that animal and he said to it from here from this day on you shall you shall go on your belly you shall drag yourself on your belly and you will crawl on the ground for the rest of your life and and we know that to be true um, a snake has a very unique way of moving along and when they get ready to strike, they have the ability to coil and strike. But when the snake has to move forward, it has to crawl on its belly. Okay? And so not only were they, the serpent highlighted, it was hampered, hindered by God. And it was the third thing I want to tell you about is that the serpent was humiliated. Notice what God says, on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I don't know about you, but that sounds kind of cool. I mean, in, in my mind, I'm thinking, if it had wings, what a bummer. Because now I can't fly. If it had legs, what a bummer, because now I can't run. But, and, and then it, it's hard enough now that you've got to drag yourself on the ground on your belly. But God said you will eat dust for the rest of your life, forever. That's how you shall be. And when I look at snakes, I don't know about you, but I know some of you don't believe this, but 
There are good snakes and there are bad snakes. <laughs> <laughs> to begin with, the good ones are the ones that aren't poisonous. That's a good thing, right? And then there are some that even if they bite you, it might hurt, but that's about all that you're going to get is a pretty tight bite and that's it, right? And then there are the ones who have poison, have fangs, and that sort of thing. And, and you know, if you don't get treatment right away, you're, you're going to die pretty quick. And some are more poisonous than others. And then there's the, the what do you call that? Uh, red or yellow? No, red, 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 black and yellow, killer fellow, or something like that. They almost said something like that, right? Coral. The coral snakes, right? And so there, there are all kinds of snakes. And I know in your mind, some of you are sitting here saying, Pastor, there's there's no there's no good snake. Amen. Amen, brother. Thank God. Right? I don't care if they're colored, I don't you know, red and white or greenish or light green or yellow or whatever, or my brother-in-law or my cousin, whatever, but they're all no good. They're no good. They're just down on the ground, snakes, low down, right? You got it. Snakes are no good. Amen. And there's something about snakes that you and I, it, it doesn't matter, all right? It, it, and, and, and a man can be six foot four and weigh 200 and whatever, and if he is surprised by a snake, he's going to jump. I mean, it's just, it, it just not a good feeling when you are around snakes. You know, they're, they're, they're just creepy, crawly creatures. And there's, there's no friendship between us. Mm -mm. You know? Now, some of you may be here this morning and you might have a pet snake. Mm -hmm. Where most of you, if you have a pet snake, probably not poisonous, if you keep poisonous snakes as a pet, God bless you. <laughs> May the Lord be merciful on your soul. <laughs> but some of us keep snakes, and, and you know, and they're not poisonous, and, and you let them out. Why? I have absolutely no idea. Yeah, exactly. Why yeah. you would put it in a cage or in a I, to begin with? I don't know why. I am of the opinion that every if it is an animal, he belongs outside. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But that is a snake, and that's what God did to the snake. And when I say snake, I'm talking about the literal snake. I'm not talking about the other one. We'll talk about him in a second. The serpent suffered the curse. There was consequences that came out of this encounter. Look at verse 15 and the first part. Then he tells the snake, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And the first consequence of the sin is that there would be hostility. There would be hostility between the woman and the serpent. And that has never changed. And that is true to this day. We are enemies. Alright? And I just alluded to all of that, so I'm not going to go into much of that. But there is a hostility between us and that particular animal. More than any other animal, there's something about snakes we just don't like. And so God put hostility between <coughs> the serpent and the woman. But host the hostility would be painful and it would be permanent. It would be painful and permanent. I've never been bitten by a snake. I, I, I lived around them all my life, you know, owing cotton and all that kind of stuff. You see them all the time. But I, but I was lucky enough not to ever been bitten. And I picked them up from the tail and I picked them up from the head, rattlesnakes, whatever, you know, you learn how to, how to handle them. But not one time was I ever comfortable with that task, ever. I'm not, a, I'm not fearful of snakes, but I avoid them just like they avoid me. 
Because the snake knows one thing. It can strike me, and I can strike it. Isn't that what God said? There will be enmity between you and the woman. And that hostility is painful and it's permanent. That relationship is never going to change until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and He returns and He fixes all that happened and all of God's plan is complete. Until then, we, there will be hostility between us and that poor animal. But here's where it changes. And here's where it becomes even deeper. Because then God says in verse 15 that the enmity would be between you and the woman. But then notice that he says, and between your seed and her seed. Your seed and her seed. And then he says, in verse 15, he shall he, and that word is masculine in the Hebrew, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And the word his there is again masculine. So we know that we know just from looking at that text that that there's a, there's a story behind the story. There's an event behind the reality, the, the, the literal, what is going on here. Beyond that snake, that literal snake, is another snake. Interestingly enough, his name is Satan, or devil, and many other names that the Bible uses to refer to him. And he is referring to a seed. But here's the interesting part. We know, we know that the woman is not the one who has the seed. It's the man. It's the man. <coughs> so what's he talking about? Who is he referring to? And so we have in the next part of the verse. A conquest. There's a battle that ensues and there's a conquest here. So let me give it to you right quick. The fall of man, point number three, the conquest, letter A, the fall of man brought death and separation. The end result, the end result of the consequence and all that happened in, in this particular passage of scripture is that Something happened. Something died. And then there was a separation that we're going to see when God starts talking to Eve and he starts talking to Adam. But what you need to know is that something died here. Death did come. The serpent lied and said death will not come. But death did come in more ways than one. We know physical death came. We know that. We look at that and we see that. But a lot of things died here. The relationship that, that God, that, that animals, that beasts had with man changed. It was no longer the same. Whatever that was, it was no longer the same. It was altered. It was altered in the worst way in the relationship between the serpent and man. Or in this case, the woman. It, it was changed forever. Never ever to be the same again. I don't know what relationship the serpent had with man and Adam and Eve in the garden, we'll never know because we were not there. We'll never know how all that interaction played out. But whatever that interaction was, from this day forward, it would never, ever, ever be the same. That died that day. Not only did that die, but the second serpent, the, the Satan person, that that demon, that angel. Something happened. Because in the fall, when Adam and Eve ate, and he was able to deceive them, there's a possibility that Satan thought, now I have an ally. I 
slain God and I want to take his place. And I've got a third of the angels with me and the rest of those angels that stayed with him. I don't like them either. But now I have an ally in the, in the, in the person of Adam and Eve. I have an ally. I can carry on my battle against God with, with Adam and Eve on my side because now they know, now they see, now, now they understand it. And, and, and we, were, we were able to open their eyes to this new world. And, 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 and for the moment, they were thinking, man, this is great. And all of a sudden, something happens. There's a relationship that changed when God came to the serpent and said, from here on out, this is the way it's going to be with you. And whatever ally Satan thought he had was ruined. Because God said, from this moment on, there's going to be enmity between your seed, Eve, and his seed, that serpent. Or another way to put it is your offspring and his offspring. Your children and his children. No wonder Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day who were trying to persuade the people to do live different, do different. He said to them, you are of your father, the devil. Because Jesus understands. By the way, Jesus was here. And Jesus understands that there are two. There is one seed, and there's a seed here, and there's a seed here. And there is the seed of Adam and Eve, and there's the seed of Satan. There are the children of this world, John tells us in Third John, there are children, there's the children of this world and there's the children of God. And the Bible tells us later on down the road that the sons of God had relations with the sons of man or the women of man. There is two distinct people here. What we need to know is that from the very beginning we discover that there is a group of people who are the children of Satan and there's the children of God. But the world would like us to think this. The world would like us to think we're all children of God. Some of us are just worse than others. That's what the world wants you to think. We're all God's children. All of us are God's children. And that's not true. It's just not true. You either know Jesus or you don't know him. You're either a child of God. Listen, I know that's tough to swallow, but that's the truth. You're either saved or not saved. You either know Jesus or you don't know Jesus. You either know God or don't know God. You're either or, but not both. There would be, listen to me very carefully, there would be no need for a Savior if we're all children of God. Think about that for a second. There would be no need for a Savior if we're all already children. If that's the case, if we're all children and we don't need a Savior, that means that you can save yourself. You just got to figure out how to get right with God. Whatever that road is. And whatever you figure out, then it would be nice of you if you share it with the rest of us. But here is, here's how I know how bad humanity is. If you're walking down the mountain one of these days and you roll into a cave that you were unaware of and all of a sudden the cave is bright with gold. Your nature, what is it going to do? Well, 
me go down to the city of Lubbock and talk to the city mayor and say, hey mayor, I found a cave full of gold and I want to share it with all of you. <laughs> Somehow I don't think that's going to happen. Here's what I think is going to happen. Hmm. How can I keep this a secret? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's nobody else's fault. And, and you know, I'm, after all, I'm going to roll down all the way down to this bottom of this cave and I'm scratched and, and bruised and I'm going to keep the gold. Human nature is not designed to do what some in our society are suggesting. Well, let's just take everything that we own and split it among all the rest of us and be kind to one another and, and everybody will have the same amount and we're all going to be very well protected and taken care of. Good luck with that. That's not in our nature. The fall of man brought death and separation. And later on down the road, we see that God takes Adam and Eve. And he says to them, you're out of here. This beautiful place that once was. This garden. By the way, the Bible says that God planted the garden. This beautiful garden that once was is, is fixing to be no longer. And you're going to be outside of this garden, out there. And I'm going to put an angel up over there with a flaming sword. And you will never, ever, 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 ever be able to get in again. By the way, we don't have time to discuss that now, but God did us a huge favor. But I'm not allowing us to get back in there. But here's where the good gospel comes in. And here's where the first gospel comes in. Because then God says, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. There's a story, and I don't know if it's true. I'm still trying to read it some more. But there's a story that says, some, some of the theologians say that, that this whole bruise your head and heel thing played out on a mountain called Golgotha. And the, and the name Golgotha means what? Skull. Mm -hmm. And what was placed on top of that skull? A cross that was driven into the skull. And at the skull, the serpent of old bruised Jesus Christ. But on the cross, Romans tells us that on the cross, Jesus Christ crushed Satan. Didn't defeat him. He crushed him. He crushed him. And that story, I will bruise, he will bruise your heel, and I will crush, he will crush your heel. Plays out from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And every one of those places in the scripture points out the very same thing. That serpent is Satan. The seed of woman is Jesus Christ. That is the first gospel. And that's the only gospel. There is no other message but that one. And so, the fall of man brought death and separation. But listen to this, and we'll close with this. The favor of God brought hope and salvation. The favor of God 
God steps in and he says, yes, you're going to bruise his heel. But he will crush your head. And if you've never had that encounter with Jesus Christ, I'm telling you today, he is the answer. And from Genesis all the way to the Bible, that story is out. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, today would be a good day. To say, yes, Jesus, I believe. That's what you came to do. I want to give you my life. I want to become a child of God. And I want to come to know my heavenly Father. I'm going to ask you to bow your head right there. Where you are. We're going to pray. And if God has spoken to your heart, and this is the message, the first gospel, from the very beginning, God established that truth. Man failed. But God provided a means by which he could be redeemed. And we'll see that play out in all of this scripture. If you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's the answer. Father, I come before you today. And Lord, I know that this is just the beginning. But Father, I pray that if someone today has now come to the realization, this, this is true. This is what God did. This is what happened. And they've never had a personal relationship with Christ. Father, I pray that you touch their heart today. Maybe somebody here this morning, Lord, has wandered off. And they need to be drawn back. Lord, I pray that you begin to draw their heart back. Someone is looking for a church to be a part of, to join. I pray, God, that you help them to see that perhaps this is the place where they need to be. You brought them here for a reason. Whatever work you are doing in the head and the heart of a person today, God, we turn that over to you. Jesus' name. Amen. As our instrument is coming, you stand with us. And just for a few moments, we're going to extend an invitation. What is that invitation? And that is, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today will be the day for you to give your life to Christ and start brand new. And if you're here and you're a child of God and you've been turned it off and you straight away, would you come back and you say, Pastor, here I am. I'm I need, to, I need to reconcile some things and I need to get right with God. And here I am. Maybe you're looking for a church. You're looking for a church, you want to be part of a church. You want to know what it takes to join Red Light. Come down and meet me right here. I'd love to talk to you about what it takes. You tell me where you are with God and I'll tell you where you are. And we, maybe you'll join in this church today. So, as we sing, God spoke to your heart. Would you come? James and I will be down here and we can talk to you. Come.